Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Rhode Island State House for Go Local Live. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel. I'd like to welcome now a member who made a long trip across the building from the other side. Senator Lou Raptakis, thank you for joining Pleasure us today. Pleasure to see you again at 50 feet away. <laughs> well, we did just have Representative Greg Amore. We had Representative Bob Catrocci. Now we're going to get the Senate take on things. And I want to ask you about a piece of legislation that you are putting forth. Let's start with this one. That would tie increases in the minimum wage to the consumer price index. I've been fighting for this bill for the last 12 years, maybe even longer. I wish we would have passed this. We wouldn't have any more debate on the minimum wage. Reason why? Tie it to the consumer price index. Sometimes you get sick and tired of all these numbers that they're throwing out nationwide, $15. How did you get that $15 an hour? Mm. When you ask those individuals for the $15 an hour minimum wage, they can't answer that question. Minimum wage in Rhode Island has to go up, has to go up every year, but tie it to the CPI, which is a real economic reflection of the economic factors in Rhode Island. We get that information from the federal government. The Department of Labor tells you the cost of goods, services, rent, fuel, and it goes on and on. That's how you tie the minimum wage. You don't just throw out these numbers, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14 dollars. And the sad part about it is you still keep getting those individuals who want to tie the minimum wage to a living wage. It makes no sense at all. What's going to happen when we have a minimum wage in Rhode Island, $15 an hour? I don't even know what the outcome is going to be in New York City where they just went to $15. I feel that you're going to see a lot of the youth, the younger generation, be pushed out of the job market. Who's going to hire an inexperienced 16, 17, 18-year-old to pay them at $15 an hour? And you know the economy is doing, is doing good. So let forces amongst, you know, let, let individual business fight for their employees. My other problem with the minimum wage going up so fast is not tying it to a CPA, let it go gradually. Mm. You also notify the business owners. They know at the end of the year what the CPI was. Those figures are released in March of a calendar year. And then the following year, you raise the minimum wage. So you give businesses nine months a good lead time to get ready to prepare for the increase. So what do you hear from colleagues when you talk about this? And certain, uh, on one side of the aisle, you've got folks uh, advocating, as I said, for that uh, living wage, if you will. And then the other side, you might have on the Republican faction uh, looking for you know, a, a really kind of stringent look at the increase in minimum wage. Is, is there a third way? Well, the third, the right way, I should say, <laughs> is to you have the minimum wage set right now at 10.50. You know the governor said she wants to raise it to 11.10, and then she said, "I want to tie it to the CPI." That's good news that they're trying to tie it in now and not start at $15 an hour. I think whatever the minimum wage is right now, I believe it's, it went up again for the about the fifth time since 2011. We got over a 50% increase in the minimum wage, and nothing's going up 50% in the last five years. Right now is call time out, adopt the CPI, and I think that's the right way. It's, it makes sense to everybody. Okay, well, we'll continue to follow that piece of the legislation on the Senate side. I also want to talk with you about two items that we've discussed a lot of times before. This is line item veto and the Inspector General. So why 2019? Again, I said to myself, I'm going to keep introducing line item veto like I have been for the last five years and the Inspector General for the last probably 12 or 15 years. And I'm not going to stop introducing both those pieces of legislation until they become law. That's my promise <laughs> to you. And I'm going to keep putting them in. They're very important. Let's take line item veto. We're one of the few states that doesn't allow it. And I don't know what the fear factor is. It's like a piece of legislation. The General Assembly knows that if we give line item veto to any governor, if they veto that article in the budget, we have the opportunity, just like a piece of legislation, that the governor vetoes to override that veto. Simple as that. So we're not losing or taking away any authority of power from the General Assembly. We're just joining the other 44 states to make it easier for a governor, instead of vetoing the whole budget, they can veto with a line item veto a certain part of the budget. It makes a lot of sense. And there's checks and balances, like I just said. The General Assembly will not lose power. They still have the authority to override that veto, plain and simple. On the Inspector, Inspector General. Inspector General. Again, Massachusetts, our good neighbor. We always like to follow the lead <laughs> of our neighborhood states. Hey, Mass raised the minimum wage. We're going to raise the minimum wage. Okay, so Mass Massachusetts has had Inspector General for years. They've saved millions. We've had a lot of heartaches. The central landfill, the registry in the past, 
different state agencies have an inspector general. It pays for itself. I think the minimum cost is around $700,000 to set up the office, but it's going to save millions. If it, it, it's some it, it, inspector general is appointed by the general officers, I believe the governor, the secretary of state, the general treasurer, the attorney general, all will appoint. They have a vote to appoint the inspector general who they're voted by the people of Rhode Island. So it's a simple factor. Given this created inspector general, small office, around seven hundred thousand dollars by the time you get it going, staff. And then that person, he or she will end up saving millions like other I believe it's 26 states have an inspector general. We have an inspector general in the federal government. If the feds can do it, why can't we? And I want to talk one more thing, because as you talk about following suit, especially just looking up north, proposal by the governor to legalize marijuana in her budget proposal this year. What have conversations been among legislators since uh, this put, was put forth by Governor Raimondo? Well, I myself cannot support it. We've had problems already with drinking and driving. Now we're going to have marijuana and driving. We still have not found a solution to curtail drinking and driving. I'm afraid that introducing that, legalizing it, except for the issues of medical use, I think we're, it's just out of control. I think we should step back, look what's happening in Colorado, look at the results in Massachusetts, give it about two, three years, see how Massachusetts is going to deal with it. Why do we jump into an unknown area? And finally, let's talk about what obviously is always the big piece of legislation. Let's look at the budget as a whole. The governor, again, looking for that legalized marijuana with a particular price tag associated with it. We've seen some numbers coming in from legalized sports betting, and they're well below what had been put forth anticipated. Um, you know, what's the situation that Rhode Island finds itself in as it's addressing the budget, putting these numbers forth, and then finding, you know, if there's a shortfall in, in sports betting, how are we to believe the marijuana projections are, are what they are? The sad thing about it is we use these as excuses to plug the hole. In good times, when we have a surplus in the budget, that's when we should look at these ideas, legalizing marijuana, sports betting. Uh, I hate to say it, truck tolls right now, I told you so, is going to be a failure. <laughs> I, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Those are something that we should entertain when we have a surplus. Mm. Now we're gambling and trying to bet that sports betting, it's not going to solve the problems because look, look what's happening. There's an issue here. Long lines, the revenue's out there. They started up late. We don't know what the outcome, and I believe poor, poor planning was probably maybe the culprit of uh, not showing those revenue numbers. And I'll tell you a quick story, Kate. Driving up from New York last week, I was at a, uh, an event in New York City. I was driving up Connecticut before the 395 uh, exit. They had north on 395. Every truck stop was full of trucks. Full. Every rest area. As soon as I got to Rhode Island, I went past that one truck rest area northbound down in Richmond. There was only two traffic trails. We'll have, to, we'll have to talk with uh, Chris Maxwell about this, because as they had projected, that trucks would just be doing an it end shows run. You that they're they doing an end run. run around Rhode Island. Well, I appreciate your taking the time again Likewise. to come across to Pleasure the side over here. here. And that just about wraps up another Go Local Live here at the Rhode Island State House. We're going to sign off here in just a few. We'll be back in the Navigate Credit Union Broadcast Center with Lifestyle. So I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel. We'll see you.